docket. Case number 108714, Raymond Fuller v. State. The court is prepared to proceed if you are. May it please the court, Crystal Dahlke on behalf of uh, Mr. Fuller, and I'd like to please reserve five minutes for rebuttal time. Five minutes is granted. Thank you. A claim that particular action or inaction on the part of trial counsel was trial strategy should not be a cure-all for uh, deficient representation. It should not excuse unethical behavior. It should not excuse betraying your client on the most, one of the most critical days of his life. It should not excuse destroying his credibility in front of the jury and insinuating his guilt during his criminal trial. Um, in this case, the Court of Appeals found that basically trial counsel's claim that his manner of direct examination was trial strategy and therefore not deficient representation, that claims of trial strategy are virtually unchallengeable, um, that shouldn't stand when the the conduct is unethical when the conduct defeats the purpose of an adversarial process. When the conduct that trial counsel does in his manner of direct examination abandons his client, betrays his client's trust, surprises his client on the witness stand, and leaves him there without an advocate during his criminal trial. Um, Mr. Fuller, uh, testified on during the evidentiary hearing that trial counsel did not go over his trial strategy with him. He was not aware that trial counsel was going to essentially attack him during direct examination. He was not prepared for this um, aggressive manner of examination. There are certain areas where um, Choices are left up to counsel where they are under, they are given to trial counsel to ultimately decide. Um, things include what witnesses to call, cross, -examin cross examination, the defense theory. Those are deemed parts of trial strategy assigned to trial counsel. However, in this case, um, the case law on that discusses that that happens after a thorough investigation and after consultation with the defendant. That didn't happen here. He gave him a list of questions he would ask, and he told him he was going to ask him if he raped the victim. Correct? He, that's not my under, he did give him a list of questions. Um, Wasn't it the lawyer's testimony at the 1507 evidentiary hearing that he told client he was going to ask him if he raped the victim? I believe he he said, I will ask you these questions. He did not explain, I'm going to ask you them in an accusatory tone. I'm not going to essentially attack you on the witness stand while you're Speaking testifying. of attacking, those questions were, the, the questions that you've identified as uh, a breach of an ethical duty um, or attacking or aggressive or harsh um, or interspersed with other kinds of more open-ended questions, weren't they? They were. Okay. Um, they were interspersed, but they were, there was not just one or two sprinkled, sprinkled within. It was, it was repetitive. There, there were maybe, um, you know, at least, I want to say five or six instances where he'd ask him a few kind of chronological events about the day and then he'd be like, and that's when you attacked her. And that's when you pulled her hair. 
And that's when you you were going to go over there and have sex with her one way or another. Uh, you told the, the police officer something different. You're a liar. You're a rapist. If you would reverse the roles in in this context, and it was the prosecutor asking Mr. Fuller these questions, that would have been grounds for an objection. It's, it, this court has said in Johnson um, and in other cases, it's inappropriate to comment on a witness's credibility, let alone call the defendant a liar in front of the jury. It's inappropriate, it's, it's prosecutorial misconduct to call the defendant a murderer in a murder case. It's inappropriate to call them a I don't rapist. Think the case law supports you on that necessarily, does it? it I think that that we said it's okay to describe the defendant as murderer in a murder case if your point is that the evidence demonstrates it. I I believe the call that in cases such as like State versus Miller, um, State versus Neal, uh, State versus Armstrong, um, you know use of epithets that might be construed of derogation of the presumption of innocence. Um, the, you know, the reference you know to, a rapist, you know a killer. Me, excuse me, the reference um, to your client as a liar, that had to do with him changing his story, right? I believe he, um, trial counsel asked Mr. Fuller, did your versions of, the, of your story change when you gave your statement to the, I think, um, you know, to the detective. Mm -hmm. And then he followed that up with, so you're a liar. And your client admitted that, in fact, his statements had changed, correct? I believe he did. Okay, thanks. Um, Counsel, is it your view, your position, that this kind of aggressive confrontational questioning by a defense attorney of his own client is per se, always ineffective? In other words, it, it, if we were to grant what you're asking for, it sounds like you're asking for a statement that would foreclose this as a legitimate strategy in any future case. I, in this case, I don't know that this court needs to come up with a black letter, you know, black and white rule. Um, but in this case, Mr. Fuller was not informed by trial counsel what trial counsel was trying to do. He felt betrayed. He didn't understand why his attorney was calling him a liar, and why he was accusing him of committing the same crimes that the victim in the state were accusing him of didn't committing. Didn't de defense counsel essentially testify that he was hoping to elicit a passionate emotional response from his client as an effective way of communicating with the jury? He did testify to that. Um, and the Court of Appeals found that, you know, this method of examination essentially softened the blow of... Took the sting. That was what he said. He wanted to take the sting by asking the questions the prosecution was already going to ask since the defendant took the stand. And wouldn't it undermine an effort to get a passionate response if the person from whom you're hoping to get it is glued in ahead of time? Doesn't that automatically take a bit of passion out of the moment? I, I mean, it does, it, you lose, I guess you lose the shock. The spontaneity. The shock spontaneity. factor, the, the surprise. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in this case, be, because of trial counsel's aggressive method of direct examination, there was little left for the prosecutor to do on cross-examination. Uh, the trial counsel had done it, his job for him. Um, he essentially switched sides and became a second prosecutor and accused Mr. Fuller, just like the victim, just like the state, accused him of being a rapist, which was the ultimate issue for the jury to decide in this case, did Mr. Fuller commit the, the acts of rape and sexual battery against the victim? And then was his defense that these acts were consensual, was he lying about them? And trial counsel told the jury, Mr. Fuller is a liar. Mr. Fuller is a rapist. By that, his method of examination, he discredited he destroyed Mr. Fuller's credibility, his own client, 
and insinuated his guilt in front of the jury. Well, there's also some argument made that after he would make these statements, he then would ask open-ended questions of his client to give him an opportunity to explain why, I guess, he was so adamant in his denial. Is that an accurate reflection of what the record shows? That's accurate, that he would, um, he would intersperse these, these kind of accusatory questions with more open-ended, you know, questions about the events of that day. That's true. Um, I, I would like to quick touch on, you know, if this court does find that trial counsel's efforts, um, you know, actions were deficient, this is something the Court of Appeals didn't get into because they found that trial counsel's efforts were, uh, or his method of examination was a strategic choice, and so he was not deficient there. Uh, we get to the prejudice prong. Um, we would first ask that this court can apply chronic. Uh, there's a little bit of, I think, discrepancy in the, the procedural history with whether or not the Court of Appeals has applied chronic to the merits of this case. Um, it is our position that the Court of Appeals, it was presented first on direct appeal. They determined that the record was not fully developed. Um, to apply chronic, distinguished it from Carter, where in that situation the, re the record was presented to the district court and developed. Um, the chronic issue was raised for the first time on appeal with the Court of Appeals in this, in this appeal, and I believe the Court of Appeals decision kind of said, well, the 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 panel on Mr. Fuller's direct appeal already addressed the chronic issue and found that it, it wasn't applicable. Um, we, would, we would argue that it is applicable, that you guys can apply chronic in this situation, that Mr. Fuller, um, you know, trial counsel abandoned his client. He, the adversarial role, role was given up. He became a second prosecutor. Um, so you think chronic applies to both the issue of the harsh questioning and the issue of the motion for new trial representation? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, would, yes. On both situations with the method of direct examination and on the post-trial and sentencing hearing, both times trial counsel did not uh, subject the proceeding to an adversarial process argue things against Mr. Fuller, abandon his client, abandon the theory of, de of the defense, and chronic should apply. In the event that this court uh, applies the traditional Strickland approach, the, the Court of Appeals was spot on uh, when they said this was clearly a credibility contest. Who was the jury going to believe? Um, you know, counsel, your counsel calling his own client on the witness stand um, a lie. So you're a liar. So you're a rapist. So you attacked her. That insinuates guilt. That discredits his testimony. That destroys his credibility. And it's sufficient to um, undermine the confidence in the jury's verdict that, hey, we believe the victim in this case. If there, maybe if, you know, if trial counsel had actually advocated and presented the defense theory that these acts were consensual, then the jury's verdict could very likely have been something something different. Um, I've used all my time. I, c I can address the other two issues on rebuttal or if this court has further questions. Any more questions? Thank you, counsel. May it please the court and counsel, Assistant District Attorney Matt Maloney for the state. Um, this court obviously is familiar with the ineffective assistance test, which puts the burden on the movement to show that not only was counsel's performance deficient, but that uh, without the alleged errors, there's a reasonable likelihood that the result of the trial would have been different. 
it is the state's position that the movement cannot meet either prong of that test. Um, now, counsel's correct, and I would concede that you can't simply avoid an ineffective assistance allegation just by throwing the word strategy out here. However, that's not what happened in this case. This, this is a situation where we had an evidentiary hearing, and counsel not only used the word strategy, but he gave several specific um, reasons why he did what he did. And in thinking about this argument, what struck me is that um, there's never been any case law indicating that defense attorneys have to take a cookie cutter approach to defending their client. And, and excuse me, before you get into that, and he made those comments or made that uh, gave that testimony at the hearing on uh, motion for new trial. Uh, well, he gave, he gave plenty of testimony at the evidentiary hearing on the 1507 motion. Okay. That, that is where the majority of his discussion was with respect to, in fact, I think that's where all of his testimony was with respect to how he questioned his client. Um, and again, I, I think the case law, quite to the contrary, indicates that reasonable attorneys will utilize different strategies. And just because something that one attorney does is not similar to what somebody else does doesn't mean that it's ineffective. And I think the Court of Appeals opinion in this case notes that while, while the strategy that Mr. Pittman took in this case probably isn't the type of thing that you're going to see every day and that when you just look at the cold transcript of it, undeniably some of the questions seem um, outside the norm of what you might expect. However, well, it seems that some of them almost beyond the pale. Well, um, I, when he... When he said, now you gave a different statement uh, to police and, and established the two different <coughs> statements, why isn't that sufficient to draw the sting without saying, so you're a liar? I, I, I mean, labeling your, your client in front of the jury after you've drawn the sting, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not seeing uh, how that's effective trial strategy. I think that it's, first of all, I think it's something that is always more difficult to see when just reading through the transcript and not being able to judge the attorney's tone of voice. And, and he testified to that at the evidentiary hearing that on many of these occasions, he used his tone of voice and his expressions to highlight what he considered to be absurdities or um, lack of credibility in the state's case. And there's always the risk that those of us that were not in the courtroom can sit here and look at the transcript and think, boy, that seems odd. However, I will note that even just upon reading the transcript for the first time, it was very evident to me that what counsel was doing was simply a rhetorical tactic. Um, any of us, whether we're attorneys or not, know that oftentimes people use irony as an effective means of communication. And I guess I find it hard to believe that the jury sitting in the courtroom wouldn't have picked up on that very easily, or that the jury would have somehow been confused and thinking, does his own attorney really think that he's guilty here? And I think that that's where Mr. Pittman's strategy of following up those questions with open-ended questions and allowing his client to expand on his answers comes into play here. If, if the defense attorney had simply asked these questions and not allowed his client to expand, we'd be in a different situation. And Mr. Pittman testified to that at the evidentiary hearing when he said that if my client hadn't been doing such a good job in dealing with these questions and connecting with the jury and responding in the way that I wanted him to, I would have, I would have scrapped this strategy and I would have gone on to something else. But he... He explained that his client seemed to be doing just fine and he was answering all of the questions consistent with the theory of defense. And I think that the jury could easily pick up on that. And as Your Honor, as, as, Judge, as Justice Byer indicated, I think that there was clear testimony from defense counsel that this, one part of the strategy here was to soften the blow. He knew that obviously the prosecutor was going to be asking these questions on cross-examination. And rather than letting his client deal with that for the first time from the prosecutor, who was not going to give him the chance to follow up with open-ended questions and a narrative about his version of, event, version of events, he put those questions to his client. And 
there's been discussion in the brief, especially in the brief, about this list of questions that, that uh, Mr. Pittman gave his client and how those questions uh, didn't match exactly what he asked at trial. Um, but Mr. Pittman did testify that he told his client before he testified that he was going to be very direct with him and he was going to ask him point blank, did you rape him? Did you do this? So while he might not have had a verbatim sentence by sentence, question by question script, first of all, though, I've never seen any requirement that an attorney do that for his client, that he even write out questions that he's planning to ask, let alone that if he does so, that it has to have every possible question that he's going to ask because obviously things change during the course of trial and even if you were to try to give your well that that's a little disingenuous usually we don't have defense counsel at uh, uh, calling his own client a rapist or a liar or uh, uh, that sort of thing the the point is <clears throat> give a heads up that you're going to use irony as a trial strategy uh, so, I, no, I don't think you have to give him a list of questions, but you have to um, uh, <coughs> let them share in what your strategy is going to be. Um, and when I call you a liar and a rapist and, and uh, uh, say that's when you ripped her shorts off, uh, that I'm, I'm not talking from my perspective, I'm talking from the prosecution's perspective or the complainant's perspective? Well, again, I think he did He did prepare his client by, for that by telling him that he was going to be direct with him and that he was going to ask him point blank, did you rape her? And I think when you look at these questions, um, I don't want the court to be under the misperception here that he was making these, that counsel was simply stating these in the form of statements. When you, many of them are phrased specifically as questions. Um, and in others, he would maybe make a statement, but then he would follow up with the word right or isn't that true. So clearly it wasn't just him saying, you're a rapist, and then moving on to some other point. It was, you're a liar and a rapist, right? Or you're a liar and a rapist, and then asking a follow-up open-ended question that allowed him to fully present his defense. And in the brief, one of the things that the movement has argued is that he was essentially left on his own to present his theory of defense. And I think that's a big part of the, the attempt to get chronic to apply is to say that counsel completely abandoned the movement, left him to fend for himself, and therefore we shouldn't have to show prejudice. Well, contrary to cases like chronic and Carter, where the court has shown a willingness to not require prejudice, in this case, counsel set forth the theory of defense throughout the trial. He did it from opening statement on. He let the jury knew, know that the theory of defense was that this was consensual. And he allowed his client very clearly to make that case in his testimony to the jury. Counsel also cross-examined the state's witnesses. Counsel did all of the things. He filed motions. He cro he. he um, gave an opening and closing, he cross-examined witnesses, he put his client on the stand and let him testify. Uh, he did all of the things that, a, that an attorney traditionally does when serving in the role of defense counsel. And so for those reasons, we're far outside a chronic or Carter situation here. Um, and that's not even getting into the fact that it is our position that on direct appeal, the Court of Appeals already indicated that a chronic type analysis is not appropriate in this case, that this is not a situation where, where counsel just completely left his client uh, to his own devices here. Um, while the movement obviously is not happy with the result of his trial, and it's easy to second guess and say, well, counsel should have taken a different approach, um, I suspect that if the verdict had been different, Many people would be saying this was a brilliant strategy by counsel. This was something that was outside of just the generic approach that you're going to take. And in a case like this where, and counsel's correct, this, this was a case that came down to credibility. There was no physical evidence. There were no eyewitnesses to this. It was the defendant's version and the victim's version. And it was going to come down to who the jury believed. And I think especially in a case like that, um, counsel doing something, trying something that's a little bit outside the ordinary is commendable. 
Um, I, I think that oftentimes in these cases, what the defense probably faces as the most challenging part to overcome is the fear that there will be jurors that simply are inclined to believe the victim, especially if the victim is somebody that comes across as um, sympathetic, as believable, as somebody that would have no reason to make up something like this. And in a case like that, if the defense, will, defense counsel just runs a typical um, run-of-the-mill defense, I think it would be hard for the defendant to really connect with the jurors or to overcome um, the, the, the victim's testimony. And that's why, and that is another basis that Mr. Pittman explained for why he phrased the questions the way he did, is that he was simply using the language, the same language that the victim and some of the police officers had used while they testified. So words like rapist and things of that nature might seem shocking. However, they were already out there in the form of the state's witnesses. And I think that also shows that that was another part of the strategy, was simply to um, use that same language and allow his client to directly respond to allegations that were already in front of the jury. So this wasn't something that, the, that when the questions were asked, the jurors were all of a sudden hearing this language for the first time. Um, this was something that was already in the record through the testimony of the victim and the detective and some of the other witnesses. So again, it all comes down to the, the strategy of being direct and blunt with his client. And he did specifically prepare him for that. Um, he might not have explained it in the way um, that we're talking about today as far as I'm going to use irony, I'm going to use a rhetorical device here, but he did tell him, I'm going to be direct with you. I'm going to ask you point blank, did you rape her? Did you do these things? Um, so he was prepared for this, and I think the, the manner in which he testified shows that he was prepared for it. There's no, there's no indication in the record that he was caught off guard, um, that he stammered through his answers, or that he uh, misspoke at all. He handled all these questions exactly the way that his attorney was hoping that he would ask him. Mr. Maloney, could I have move you on to the next issue? Um, of ineffective assistance having to do with the motion for new trial hearing and sure. whether there was conflict and whether there was an aban if not an abandonment, an absence of representation at that point? Sure. I think that um, the case law that I cited does stand for the proposition that it's not an abandonment or a per se conflict simply because a defense attorney responds. Um, to an allegation such as those made by the defendant at the hearing. Um, and in fact, some of the cases, at least one of the cases I cited, involved a situation where the defense attorney specifically refuted one of the allegations that his attorney, that his client had made. And this court indicated that that was not, um, did not find that that was a conflict. And when you read all of the cases in this area, I think they do indicate that when a defendant raises an issue like this, it is appropriate uh, it's, it's permissible for the district court to ask, to, to conduct some sort of an inquiry before simply deciding that, well, just because he's alleged that there was something that his attorney did that he's not happy with, we don't have to automatically appoint new counsel and determine, based on a determination that there's a conflict, that there is kind of an initial step that the district court should take and then decide based on what it learns uh, from that inquiry whether it is necessary to appoint new counsel um, because there's a conflict. And here, counsel did simply respond. I think the, the main focus at that hearing that the two allegations had to do with um, whether the jury was fair and whether, the, whether counsel had somehow not um, removed the jury, the jurors that the movement wanted. And um, there was a second issue there um, and counsel simply gave his take on those issues. Um, he did not abandon his role. He didn't concede guilt or do any of the things that you've seen in some of the cases where the court has found that there is, in fact, a conflict of interest. He continued to represent his client's interest. He continued to ask for a departure. Uh, he did argue on behalf of his own motion for new trial that there was insufficient evidence. So essentially, all he did was respond to a couple of specific questions that the court asked 
with respect to the makeup in the, of the jury. And I, I think the other was whether there was a violation of a, an order in limine that was discussed briefly. Um, so while counsel did respond with candor to the court, which I think is, is his duty, he did not abandon his role as, as, a, as an advocate for his client here. Um, so this and, is distinct from our Sharkey case? I think so, yes. I, and I think this is more in line with the cases that I cited where um, <coughs> it's, it's okay for an attorney to, to simply answer the court's questions, even if that does conflict with, with uh, the client's version on a certain issue, as long as counsel does continue his role um, as an advocate. And I would note, for what it's worth in this case, that it wasn't until the hearing itself that the movement first complained about any of those things. In, in his handwritten motion for new trial, the movement simply complained about, um, for lack of a better term, trial errors. He never complained about counsel. It wasn't until he was arguing at the motion hearing that he kind of in a roundabout way said something that, that made it obvious to the court that there was perhaps an allegation of, of a disagreement with when counsel. When you say the motion hearing that time, you're talking about the motion for new trial. Correct, right? yes. That his pro se motion didn't talk about it in terms of IAC. It talked about trial error, but then it put an IAC gloss on it when he spoke. Out. Right. And I think it was, as I read the transcript, it almost appeared that it was just kind of an afterthought. He had complained that the jury wasn't fair, um, and then just kind of as, as a last statement said something about, I, I don't think my attorney did all that he could do in that manner. And then the court followed up, and that's when we got some of the more specifics um, out there. So I think that, too, um, as far as determining whether there was a conflict so great that there's no need to um, even show prejudice. I think that that would weigh against the defense is that if this, if, if there really were such a grave conflict in this case, I find it unlikely that the movement wouldn't have even mentioned it um, in his motion, in the written motion for new trial. I see that I'm out of time. I'd be happy to take any more questions. Uh, but outside of that, we would just respectfully argue that while counsel strategy in this case uh, might not have been been the type that you see every day of the week, that is in no indication. That's in no way an indication that it was deficient uh, performance. Let alone that the movement would have received a different verdict um, if not for counsel's conduct. I don't Come. recall was the uh, judge at the fifteen oh seven hearing the trial judge. Let's see, I should have that in my notes right here. Um, I don't believe that it was, Your Honor. I think that I have in my notes that that was Judge Turnus that conducted the evidentiary hearing, um, and I think that it would have been Judge Gearing that presided over trial. So the presiding judge would also not have had the benefit of the tone or uh, irony uh, he wouldn't have been able to see the examination, although he would have been able to judge Mr. Pittman's credibility as a witness at the evidentiary hearing. Yeah. Any more questions? Kind of curious, you said this is not the kind of strategy that comes along every day. Have you ever seen it? I've certainly seen cases where counsel asks pointed questions. I would, I would acknowledge that this is probably... Um, that this case probably is the case where the strategy was most consistent in asking um, questions along these lines. But again, I don't necessarily think that that's a bad thing. It could also be that um, this, is an, this is a strategy that maybe more attorneys should pursue when you're in a case like this where it simply comes down to credibility and you're trying to help your client make as strong an impression as possible. So while it's while it's unusual and maybe even unique, um, perhaps it shouldn't be unique. Perhaps, perhaps we should be having more cases where a counsel or an attorney tries to take this type of approach rather than fewer. So, um, but no, I don't know that I've come across one where it's developed to this extent. Well, we had the Cheatham case where counsel had his client stand up during voir dire and said, this guy's a dope dealer and a killer of people. Uh, we found that to contribute to the circumstances that led to the reversal of, of the death of the uh, conviction and, and death penalty. Um, I was just looking at that as a part of, of, of this. 
so we've at least had it in that context since I've been here. And of course, in that situation, the, the difference being that at that point in the trial, obviously the defendant would not have been in a position to respond to something like that. And it, that comes across as a, as a direct statement rather than a question that allows his client to follow up. And obviously in Vore Dyer, the defendant's not going to get a chance to, um, to respond immediately to that type of a statement. Whereas here, it was, it was things asked in the form of questions, which counsel then did allow his client to... Um, follow up on and I, I would simply note as I did in the brief that the theory of defense here was all put forth during defendant's testimony in addition to what counsel did during uh, opening statements so if if the defendant wasn't able to present his theory of defense um, he sure did a good job of obscuring that fact because he did an excellent job of letting the jury know exactly what his story was so any more questions Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Is there five minutes for rebuttal? Um, very, very briefly, uh, I did want to point out one thing, um, one quote from citing the Florida v. Nixon decision in this court's Edgar v. State decision. Uh, in addition, an, an attorney undoubtedly has a duty to consult with the client regarding important decisions, including questions of overarching defense strategy. I think here there's a little bit of a difference between telling your client, I'm going to ask you pointed questions. I'm going to ask you, you know, specific questions about the facts. There's a difference between saying, are you a liar? Are you a rapist? That trial strategy, trial counsel's defense strategy was, uh, that was his entire strategy. And not once did he clue in Mr. Fuller to the extent of how far he was going to go with his method of direct examination. He did not fulfill this duty and consult with Mr. Fuller about his overarching defense strategy. Um, real quick on the, the questions from the post-trial and sentencing hearing, I do want to point this court to look at its decision in um, Pro or State versus Prado that came out last July, where kind of similar facts that was regarding on a motion to withdraw plea. Um, but here, you know, Mr. Fuller's motion for a new trial was based off of trial counsel, didn't strike certain jurors, um, and failed to object on a, a motion in limine violation. Those are claims of ineffective assistance of counsel. And he was forced to argue that pro se, and then trial counsel was given an opportunity to respond, who didn't argue on behalf of Mr. Fuller. He, he gave strategic reasons as to why he didn't strike the juror and why he didn't object to the state's line of questioning that um, was, was um, fell in that realm of the motion and limine coverage. Uh, neither of those issues, the substance of neither of those issues is still in play, right, today? Those, well, those issues, the issue having to do with um, uh, failure to strike a juror, the substance of it, whether there was error, Oh, the merits of the no. Right. I, I it's no, raised in the whether this he was um, denied conflict free counsel. That, I guess I, that's. The I understand, issue. but the point is the um, the substance of those issues was disposed of and not appealed in the district court. Yes. Okay. Yes. Which I guess brings me to um, kind of where I wanted to go with the third issue regarding failure to call Ms. Schwartz as a witness. Um, I think there's a little bit of a <coughs> jurisdictional, you know, issue on that. Um, we do recognize that the notice of appeal in Mr. Fuller's case does specifically reference the denial from the June 8, 2012 hearing. Um, it, it does not uh, discuss the denial of Mr. Fuller's claims from the preliminary hearing that happened earlier um, the Court of Appeals determined that it did not have authority, that the Notice of Appeal did not cover those claims, but did go ahead and review this issue. Uh, we would ask um, 
for practical reasons that this court follow suit, uh, that a claim under State versus Ortiz could be made here that Mr. Fuller was given counsel. Uh, he wanted an appeal in this case. He pursued an appeal in this case. Counsel filed a somewhat insufficient or incomplete notice of appeal. Um, and therefore, Mr. Fuller was essentially denied his his ability to to continue and perfect and complete this appeal. Uh, the Court of Appeals ha did address this issue. Um, we argue that, you know, for purposes of whether or not Mr. Fuller is entitled to an evidentiary hearing on his claim of whether trial counsel was ineffective for not calling or proffering Ms. Swartz's testimony. Um, that has not been developed at an evidentiary hearing in front of the district court. Um, but the facts surrounding that context are fully developed that this court could review the issue, the limited issue of whether or not for Mr. Fuller is entitled to an evidentiary hearing. Um, I'm distinguishing it there because I'm not asking you to, to make the ultimate conclusion that this was ineffective assistance of counsel. It's whether or not Mr. Fuller is entitled to an evidentiary hearing on this one issue because he was not granted that right at the district court level. Um, as far as can Mr. Fuller show prejudice, you know, Ms. Swartz's testimony that would have uh, corroborated his test his defense that he, these acts were consensual, that they were welcomed by the victim. Um, the kind of the assumption that by the Court of Appeals indicating, oh, trial counsel didn't call Ms. Swartz and that was a matter of his trial strategy. That's not, those facts aren't in the record. Um, that wasn't an issue brought up at the evidentiary hearing. So reasons why trial counsel did, did not call Ms. Swartz, did not proffer her testimony, was, is not fully developed. It wasn't one of the three issues before the court on the evidentiary hearing? No. But it was one of the seven in the motion? Is that what you're telling us? Yes. Okay, thanks. It was, it was denied at the preliminary hearing. Right. This court has any further questions? Any more questions? Thank you, Council, for the arguments this morning and this afternoon. The court will take this matter under advisement. That concludes.